Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Happy almost start of school. We're just a week out. Um, really excited to have you here today to kick off our kindness initiative um, with our speaker, Kate Denial. Um, we were a little bit late getting our sign-up sheet out just outside the auditorium. So if you missed that, please stop by on your way out and sign in so we'll know that you were here. So let me introduce our speaker. Kate Denial is the bright, distinguished professor of American history, chair of the history department, and director of the Bright Institute at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. A distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, Kate is the winner of the American Historical Association's 2018 Eugene Asher Distinguished Teaching Award and a former member of the Digital Public Library of America's Educational Advisory Board. Kate currently sits on the board of Commonplace, a journal of early American life, and her new book, A Pedagogy of Kindness, will be published next year, 2024. Her historical research has examined the early 19th century experience of pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing in upper Midwestern Ojibwe and missionary cultures, research that grew from her previous book, Making Marriage, Husbands, Wives, and the American State in Dakota and Ojibwe Country in 2013. As director of the Bright Institute at Knox College, Kate oversees a program which supports 13 faculty from liberal arts schools across the United States in their teaching and research for three years, while providing them with $9,000 in research funds and convening an annual summer seminar. Kate is also the PI on a $150,000 grant awarded to Knox College by the Mellon Foundation in July 2022 bringing together 36 participants from across higher education in the United States to explore pedagogies, communities, and practices of care in the academy after COVID-19. So please help me welcome Kate Denial. Can you all hear me? Is the mic working? Yes, you can hear me. Great, okay. So, hello everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm so glad to see you here this morning. I am here to talk about a pedagogy of kindness. You can access these slides if you would like to look at them on a laptop or a device at this particular email address. So it's bit.ly slash pedagogy of kindness. And please feel free to download them, to have them ready for yourself, to make a copy for yourself, anything that you would like to do. So I'll pause just a second for the people who are pulling this up on their phones. Okay. In case there's anybody in the room who has vision difficulties or reading difficulties, you'll find that I read a lot of the text on these slides out loud, and I just wanted to flag why I'm doing that. It's not because I am uh, condescending to anybody. It's just to make sure that these are fully accessible. I always start my talks by thanking my teachers. So I want to say thank you to everyone who was at the Digital Pedagogy Lab in 2017. Charles Bailing and Roger Fisher, who are from the Intergroup Dialogue Program at the University of Michigan. Karen Costa, Clay Mahoney, Judith Duttle, Melissa Whaler, and Jessamine Newhouse, who've all been part of my teaching community. And at my college, Gabriel Rayleigh Carlin, Jennifer Foubert, Deirdre Doherty, Hilary Lehman, Mary Arman, and very importantly, my students, who are the guinea pigs for everything that I'm gonna be talking about here today. We are going to be free writing together. So grab a pencil or a pen and some note paper or pull up a device and open an app. We have some note paper that we're going to pass around for everybody. Um, this free writing is just for you. You are not going to have to share it with anybody. Um, it's just uh, to give you a little pause to be able to process some of what I'm saying and to think about its application to your particular teaching situation. Anybody else need no paper?
So I want to start with this quote from Angel Kyoto Williams. For us to be transformed as individuals, we have to allow for the incompleteness of any of our truths. And I wanted to start with this to say, please take what is useful from this presentation and leave the things that are not. You are expert teachers, and you are the authority on what happens in your classroom. I hope there are some new ideas for you here. There may be some things that you are already doing, and I want you to feel affirmed and awesome about that. Um, but I always like to think about, are we thinking about how we might change, add to, modify the things that we are already doing? So here's our agenda. I am going to introduce myself. Um, then we're going to talk about academia and kindness in a general way. We will talk about the things that we learn and unlearn as teachers across the duration of our careers. And then we will talk about what a pedagogy of kindness is very specifically. We will also then end by talking about kindness towards the self, because you can't be kind to other people if you're not being kind to yourself first. So introducing myself. I am Kate Denial. I am originally from Sheffield in the north of England, and I am a first-generation college student. That is a photograph of the University of Nottingham where I got my undergraduate degree in American Studies. I emigrated to the United States in 1994 to get my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and I got my PhD from the University of Iowa in 2005. Since then, I have worked at Knox College in Illinois. That is the best photo anyone has ever taken of our college campus. It's stunning. We don't all walk around limbed with light all the time. The last thing that I watched on television was Motel Rescue, which I highly recommend if you're into HGTV sort of things. I started to read The Great Believers on the flight here. I am a giant Captain America fan in all of Captain America's incarnations, and I'm very pleased to meet you. So let's talk about academia and kindness. A pedagogy of kindness is three things. It's justice, believing students, and believing in students. So I want to define our terms. Martina Spada said in Policing the Planet, no change for the good ever happens without it being imagined first, even if that change seems hopeless or impossible in the present. And Jason Reynolds, who is a children's author, said on NPR's On Being, but how does one keep an imagination fresh in a world that works double time to suck it away? I think that the answer is one must live a curious life. So what does kindness mean to you? I want you to take a couple of minutes to free write for yourself some definitions of what kindness is to you, and I will keep time and then pull us back. Okay, so wrap up the thought that you're having right now. 
And thank you for taking the time to think about what kindness means to you. I want you to keep that in the forefront of your mind as we keep talking. So what does kindness mean to me? First, I always talk about what kindness is not. Kindness is not being nice. This photo of dog, by the way, comes up when you search for kindness on Pexels.com. There were only so many photos about kindness, and so I took the dog. Um, kindness is not about being nice. Nice put band-aids over deep wounds. It also lies about things that are happening on our campuses. So it lies about precarity and the rigors of trying to teach if you are a lecturer on a short-term contract, for example. It lies about power imbalances. It wants us to imagine that there are none when there are very significant power imbalances on our campuses. It lies about what we mean when we appeal to tradition and rigor. Um, these are words that have a place in academia, but that are often very controversial words, and sometimes they're used as a way of trying to push back against needed change. It lies about burnout and exhaustion, and just how hard the work of teaching can be. And it lies about ableism, and the ways in which our campuses are not fully accessible to one another and to our students and communities. But kindness, on the other hand, is honest. It's honest about several things, and I'm going to just identify three of them. The first is about our positionality. Academia continues to be hostile to many of us along lines of race, gender, sexuality, religion, nationality, citizenship, disability, and other classes. Where do we have power, and where do we suffer from its lack? Kindness asks us to take stock. It's honest about accountability. To dismiss the places where we trip in word or thought or action without reflecting on the impact of each is nothing more than being nice. It's relieving ourselves of responsibility and prioritizing feeling good over being just. And kindness is honest about being a discipline. We will not always feel like being compassionate. I have not reached some pinnacle of enlightenment where I just exude good feelings all the time. We do not need to direct our energy into niceness. Instead, we need to remind ourselves that we believe in compassion and act upon that belief, even on the days when we're spitting mad, hollowed out, and heart sore. So what have we learned and unlearned to this point in our careers? Is academia kind? Guilty silence. <laughs> Generally, no. It is not a kind place. And there are lots of reasons for that. We are socialized into distrust very early in our academic career, certainly when we go to graduate school, often before that. There is the myth of the solitary genius, right? That a successful academic is someone who does not depend on anyone else, who just labors away in a lab or an office, who um, is not responsible to anybody, but just sort of has incredible flights of imagination and insight and produces things. Most of us don't live that life. And yet that is sort of the epitome of what an academic life is often held up to be. There is a lot of competition in academia. We are not taught to see each other as collaborators, but rather as people that we are in competition with, if not on our campuses, then certainly between campuses. We are in competition for the, pe the students who will come here. We are in competition for grants, for fellowships, for funding packages of any kind. There's ableism. This is a really, really big one. The um, institutions of higher education in the United States are founded on eugenic principles, and we have not gotten rid of those completely yet. So we have to be thinking more critically about what it means to actually be welcoming to people with disabilities on our campus, whether they are students, faculty, or staff. Exclusion is a huge part of the history of higher ed. 
Um, the number of different groups who have been excluded over time, the first institutions of higher ed in what is now the United States, were based upon being white and male and Christian. And we have expanded things since then, but there are still groups that find it so, so hard to get access to the education that they deserve. And then there's antagonism. When I walked into being a graduate student, for example, I was taught not to trust my students. And I think that is something that flows through a lot of academia in the United States. So I'm gonna take me as an example in my graduate student days as that example. As a graduate student, I was explicitly taught students are our antagonists. They are out to oppose all the things you want to achieve. They plagiarize, they cheat, they won't do the reading, and they will challenge their grades. This was the teacher training that I got before I was put into a classroom for the first time. This was then compounded when I got out of graduate school and became a first-time professor. I had post-traumatic stress disorder <clears throat> that I hid from people because I was afraid that if people knew I had PTSD, that they would not give me a job, they would not support me in my teaching, they would want to find some way to get rid of me. I had no models for kindness. My campus was, and my department especially, very antagonistic, very, very competitive. Um, and in looking around for you know, ways that I was supposed to be a teacher, I did not see kindness in the way that anybody was doing that job. I was completely overwhelmed. I was teaching six new courses that first year, um, and I did not know the first thing about how to do that. I got no training, no extra training. My graduate school didn't really give me the tools that I needed to be able to make that transition. And then there was the student who said to me, you're just not Knox material. This was in a class in my first term of my first year. Knox is on a trimester system, so you'll hear me say term a lot. Um, who was not having a good time in my class. And I asked him to come to office hours and said, you know, it's clear you're not enjoying the class. What can we do to try and change that situation? And he looked at me and said, well, the problem is you're just not Knox material. And I was crushed. I also had, after a little while, a sense of, oh my goodness, what is this hazing that is going on, right? But it was a very pivotal moment for me as a first year professor. So how did I learn to do it differently? Because none of those things are the way that I teach now. There were four things that made a big difference. The first was a project called Bringing History Home, which ran from 2001 to 2011, based in Iowa, but reaching out to other states too. The idea was that it was professional development for teachers, that we would teach them how to think like historians and do historians' work, and then they would have their students from K through 12 do the things historians did at an age-appropriate level. So we had kindergartners doing historical research, and it was fantastic. The teachers who were our master teachers in that program were unfailingly kind and patient. They had unending patience for all my questions, for the things that I maybe didn't get right the first time, and I learned a tremendous amount from every single one of them about how to think about your students. The second is intergroup dialogue, which is a program that comes out of Michigan and has been running for over 30 years. It's a way of having very structured conversations between different groups of people around fraught, contentious social issues. So for instance, about race, or class, or sexuality, or religion. Um, I help bring intergroup dialogue to my campus and co-direct that program with Gabriel Rayleigh Carlin. And intergroup dialogue has this way of slopping out of its bucket. Once you start uh, facilitating intergroup dialogues, you can't help but move those practices into your other classrooms. And so this had a big impact on how I teach. Living with PTSD was a huge part of my learning curve. I had to learn to be kind to myself, 
to give myself compassion for everything I was dealing with. And as I learned to do that, it became clear to me that most people were in dire need of receiving compassion and thinking about kindness. And the last thing was that I went to the Digital Pedagogy Lab in Fredericksburg, Virginia in 2017. I was asked to critically question everything. Now, at this point in 2017, I thought I was a cool teacher. I thought I had most of it figured out. I thought that I was uh, someone students really trusted and that we had a great rapport in the classroom. Things were working well. But DPL was the first time I had been asked so bluntly to defend my pedagogical choices. And once I reflected, I found most of my pedagogy indefensible. At the time, I felt regret and no small amount of embarrassment. My teaching was undone by the presence of a question that was never articulated quite this directly, but was everywhere around me. Why not be kind? So I would like you to free write again for just a couple of minutes and reflect on a time where somebody did something in academia that showed you that kindness matters. So take two minutes and I will keep time again. Okay, finish up the thought that you have right now. So we're going to talk about what a pedagogy of kindness is. And I, as I previewed for you, it is three main things. It's about justice, believing students, and believing in students. And I want to define these in very, very practical, concrete terms. So let's think about justice, first of all. 71% of undergraduates nationally fit the description of a non-traditional student by this definition offered by Chris McDonald. They're at least 25 years old, attend school part-time or work full-time, vet are a veteran, have children, wait at least one year after high school before entering college, have a GED instead of a high school diploma, are a first-generation student, are enrolled in non-degree programs, or have re-entered a college program. We don't normally think of the number of, first generation, of uh, non-traditional students as being that high, but this is a really good moment to just reflect upon how many of our students fall into these categories that we might not have immediately thought when we looked at them were categories that matter to them. 10% of the undergraduates at UTC are defined as adult learners and 10% are part-time. 38% of the undergraduates at UTC received Pell Grants in 2022. 22% of the undergrads at UTC identified as black, indigenous, or a person of color, BIPOC, in 2022. 20% of undergraduates nationally identified as LGBTQIA+. This number is likely to be higher 
because there is real risk to many students telling someone in authority that that is how they identify. So 20% is the floor, and we're really talking about many more. 19% of undergraduates identify as disabled. And again, that number is likely to be much higher because to be counted as having a disability, you have to have undergone testing, you have to have paperwork, you have to have gone through a certain process on your campus, and not everybody can do that or wants to do that. 43% of undergraduates of four-year institutions experience housing insecurity during their degree program. And 29% of those same undergraduates experience food insecurity while they are seeking their degree. So what does all of this have to do with kindness? It's about three main things. That we question our assumptions. Do we know who our students are and who they are not? It's about extending the benefit of the doubt to our students and having a realistic assessment of what it costs us and them if we don't do that. It's all about, also about getting rid of hoops that we make our students jump through. We want to believe in what and how much our students are telling us about their own educational experience. So that's justice. And we have believing students and believing in students. So what does believing students mean? This is an excuse you probably heard when somebody has to turn in an assignment, right? My printer broke, or I was sick, or someone died, or my laptop crashed. We could make a very long list, right? And my suggestion is that whenever this comes up, we should believe the student who is telling us that. This is because we're looking to cultivate trust, not only with that student, but with all the other students in our classes who are going to hear about their experience with us, either through the grapevine or directly because they're right in front of us when it happens. Now, I often get stopped to say, like, okay, but isn't there a real risk here that a student's going to pull one over on me? And I, of course there is that risk, but I would rather take that risk than the risk that I'm going to disbelieve a student who is genuinely experiencing a crisis. And often when students say to us, the printer broke, the dog ate my homework, right? It may not be the truth of why they did not get the thing done, but it is telling us that there's some kind of problem with which they need some help. Believing in students means rethinking our syllabi, assignments, and activities, and homework with that trust in mind. So reversing that way of thinking of students as antagonists. And it means collaborating with students on their learning. So I want to give you concrete examples of what this looked like for me in the before times, right? So in 2017, um, at the Digital Pedagogy Lab, I was asked, who is the student you are imagining as you write your course documents? Who's in your head? Is it a student that you trust? What do you communicate about who you are, who I am, through the way that I talk about my classroom policies? And are my syllabus and assignment sheets accessible to as many students as possible? So when I reflected, I had to admit the person who was in my head when I wrote my syllabus, for example, was a student I did not trust. I had to admit that I thought that my, my policies, which I thought were so enlightened, actually communicated that I was in a position of unassailable authority and I was not approachable. And were my syllabus and assignment sheets accessible? No, not in the slightest. They were just walls of text. So here's an example. This is the beginning of a syllabus that I wrote in 2017. Uh, as you can see, I opened the syllabus by just sort of throwing some really important information at my students, uh, who I am, where they can find me, when they can find me. I have a very dry description of an American history course that would make no one want to take the class. Um, and then I just leap to, here's the book that you're going to have to get. 
This is what a sample syllabus of mine looks like now. So I have a cheerful header, and that's to draw my students in and say, like, it's going to be fun. <laughs> and uh, there is alt text embedded in that header so that if someone is using a screen reader, they will know what that image is. Instead of just saying, throwing information at my students, I articulate a welcome, and I model my pronouns. I do not demand that my students tell me their pronouns, but I do model mine so that they can pick that up if they want to. I use a very clear font, and I am very transparent about my own needs and boundaries, and that's part of being kind. So here I say, uh, you can reach me by email, and here's my email address, I'm available by email from 9 till 8, Monday through Thursday, and 9 to 4 on Fridays. Saturdays and Sundays are my recharge days, so I'll occasionally check my email, but cannot guarantee you a quick reply at those times. So from the first day, my students know that that's going to be the pattern. This is another page uh, from that syllabus. I have icons down the left side of the page to help students navigate the text. It's no longer a wall of text. It, things are broken up into smaller digestible chunks. I don't use a lot of red or green in case people have color uh, vision deficiency. I have a UDL framing. UDL is Universal Design for Learning, and it's a way of trying to make our classes as accessible to as many different kinds of learners as possible. So my UDL framing here is I try to design my classes to be accessible to everyone, but there may have been things I haven't thought of. Please let me know if there's something that else that would help you succeed in class. So I'm asking them to collaborate in making this a good experience for them. And then I also have the information about how they get accommodations um, and our Office of Disability Services. And I also give them their email, their phone number, as many ways of contacting them as I can give them. This is a policy from my 2017 syllabus. This is our honor code. The Knox College community expects its members to demonstrate a high degree of ethical integrity in all their actions, including their academic work. Examples of academic dishonesty include plagiarism, giving or receiving unauthorized help, voluntarily assisting other students in cheating, and dishonestly obtaining an extension. If you have any questions about this, or if you're panicking about your ability to meet deadlines, please come and talk with me. And then a PDF link. It's very efficient. <laughs> this is what it looks like now. We commit ourselves to act with academic integrity this term. We, both of us, right? Students and me. To be ethical in what we say and write, and to offer credit to others for thinking of ideas before us. And then the most important line. I believe that everyone in my course is fundamentally honest. And I will help you learn the conventions of academic integrity, such as citing sources correctly and being clear about where our own words begin and end. Very different tone while getting across the same essential information. When it came to my assignments and thinking about what they were going to look like, I used to have a culminating project that was a very traditional history research paper. If you have taken a history class at any point in your life, including high school, you have probably written some kind of paper like the one I asked my students to write. I was very wedded to the idea that writing equaled showing learning. And so I want to pause here for one second, a little time out. This is from my book. My undergraduate and graduate professors taught me that historians communicate through writing, that the act of writing is inseparable from the act of knowing. This is plainly untrue. It has taken academia years, and it is an ongoing process to reveal people's assumptions about who gets to participate in academic spaces based on the expectation that knowledge should be written down. If we insist that students must demonstrate their understanding of concepts, principles, and ideas through writing alone, we risk marginalizing and alienating students whose disabilities make it difficult to express themselves through that medium and organize words on a page. It is vital that we distinguish between the substance we hope our students know and the means by which they tell us they know it. 
So I am not saying kick out writing, right? That is not the message here. But the message is there are multiple ways in which our students can demonstrate knowledge, and we should be thinking about that. So here's that research paper. It was very formal and yet entirely vague. So formulate your own question about the history of birth control and reproduction in the United States, identify the resources that will help you answer your question, research the topic, and write up your findings in a paper that's eight to 10 pages long. Very, very not structured, right? Um, here is I'm expressing some of my distrust in my students' ability to do the work. And I was saying, OK, you must have two secondary source websites, uh, six scholarly articles, two books, which was a sort of uh, a confession that I did not think I had prepared them to do this very well. As I grade your papers, I'll be looking for the following things. An introduction, a thesis statement, strong organization, careful analysis of your sources, right? The problem is not the scaffolding. The problem is I was expecting this little phrase on my assignment sheet to do all the work I had not yet done with them about what a good paper should look like. And in fact, I was, when I wrote this assignment sheet, completely unaware that I was not doing my job in getting them ready to do it. And then there was a checklist, too. So this was an epic assignment sheet, right? It went on for pages. Um, and the checklist um, reiterated some things, added some more stuff they should think about. I said, cite your sources carefully. <coughs> using footnotes that follow the rules set out in the Chicago Manual of Style, but I didn't tell them where to find it. I had not in class showed them where to find it online or where it was in the library. And then again, more distressed. Use 12-point font, which is an implicit sense of if, you don't, if I don't tell you 12-point font, you're going to give me 27-point font, right? Uh, your essay must be double-spaced and have one-inch margins because you will offer me something very different. Um, save a copy of your paper for yourself is a confession that I might lose your paper. Here's what it looks like now. So the cheerful header again with the alt text embedded in it. And now it's a different kind of assignment. So here it says, your second assignment is to show me what you have learned this term in any medium but a paper. So we've done papers at other times in the term. They had written quite a lot for me. This assignment was, I want to know what you know. I don't want to know what you can write. Um, that meant they got to co-create the assignment. I offered them very specific scaffolding. They had to do a paper proposal. They had to tell me how they thought that I should grade their, their project. And then I told them where and how to turn it in. I offered them a link to the citation site, and I had gone over citation deeply in class by this point. And then I repeated the dates of the assignment at the end. I also then started collaborating with my students on grading. So this was to encourage metacognitive reflection and to get them to focus on their strengths. There's incredible research that shows that when we write, comments on people's papers, their problem sets, whatever it is that we're asking them to do, and we add a letter or a number at the end, the students will read the letter or the number, and they will not read the comments. So this is a self-evaluation form that I used to use. This is um, some very simple questions. Did you turn your paper in on time? Did you ask for an extension? Did you explore connections between at least two texts? Did you explore connections between the texts and things we talked about in class, right? But then the second page got much more metacognitive. In what way was this paper an act of exploring new intellectual territory for you? What discoveries did you make about yourself writing this paper? How could you improve before your next assignment? And is there anything else I should know in relation to you in this paper so that if they broke up with their partner, if someone was sick at home, they had a space to tell me that that had affected the way that they did the assignment. They also turned to um, authentic assessment. So authentic assessment is something where the project has meaning beyond the classroom, and it has an audience other than you, okay? 
So here um, is an example from our chemistry department. We have a thing called Knox Biofuels Week. And in Biofuels Week, the general chemistry students create a biofuel. The organic chemistry students help with that and identify the components of the biofuel. And then the physical chemistry students perform combustion tests to determine the efficiency of the fuel. This is what some students had to say about that experience. This lab teaches me how to work as a team member and how to communicate effectively, which is important for my career as a research scientist. We have the chance to learn not only technical skills, but also interpersonal skills. I think my experiences in all of my labs leading up to Biofuels Week helped prepare me for this. Because we were working with general organic and physical chemistry, there were concepts that I learned as a first year that came back up that week. So asking people to retrieve knowledge, right? The most effective way of, of cementing knowledge in someone's head. This is an authentic assessment my students did called beforenox.com. This is a collaborative digital history project. Here we researched the history of the place that Knox is built before Knox was built. Um, and so they did little blog posts uh, that they researched. We had a timeline, and every timeline entry had a, a primary source attached to it. Every blog post had to have primary sources attached to this. And I only show this slide because I'm a geek, and the bibliography makes me super happy. And it goes on for pages. You're just glad I don't have 16 slides showing you how big it was. Um, but here's the audience that was not me, right? We had a message <clears throat> from Ana Naruto Maya, who is the project director of the Indigenous Digital Archive, because she had been looking for sources and found our website, found our bibliography, found the reports that students had written, and it was useful to her and her community in the work that they were doing. Smaller assignments can be just as effective as big ones, too. So this is a reading check-in. This is not graded in my class. I ask them how much reading they've done, and that is not so I can be punitive, but so that I avoid that sinking feeling of walking to the classroom and realizing, oh, nobody did the reading today. What am I going to do for the next 50 minutes, right? Um, I ask, what new things did you learn? What is important we talk about? What left you confused? What questions do you have? And I use their answers to then build my lesson plan for the day. So there is a feedback loop where they see that what they write on these things matters, but I don't have to respond to 30 of these things for every class. I also have them look back on the week at the end to do a metacognitive reflection of the things they thought were important that week. So I just ask them, what are the three things that were so important to you this week that you learned? So what are we believing in? We are believing in students' ability to have input into course policies and grading, their students' ability to co-create syllabi and assignments, and their investment in the courses that they shape. So over to you again. Reflect on one small thing you could do to increase collaboration with your students in your courses this fall. And if you're on sabbatical this fall, next spring. Um, Take a couple of minutes to free write, and then I will keep time.
Thank you for taking that moment. And if you're interested, I'd love to hear your ideas after this is all over uh, for how you're going to increase collaboration in your classrooms. So the last part, the last puzzle piece of this is about kindness towards the self. So kindness towards the self includes these things, that you are not trying to change everything at once. It's not an accident that I'm showing you a syllabus in 2017 and a syllabus in 2023. It took time for me to get to where I am now, changing little things as I went. A good rule of thumb is just plus one. What is one thing that you could alter this coming semester? And what's one thing you could do the semester after that? Don't overload yourself and try to shift everything at once. Recognize you're the authority on your classroom experience. You have different embodied experiences of being in the classroom to me, right? You teach at a different kind of campus to me. So use the fact that you know what your student body is like and what you are like in the classroom to your advantage. Know the boundaries you need and that will work for you. Think about those very carefully and give yourself time and space to think and reflect about the process. So here are some concrete examples of things that I think are really important for anybody who's doing this kind of job. Set your email hours and communicate them really clearly. So don't just be on email all the time. Don't set up the expectation from your students that if they email you at midnight, you're going to be able to reply to them right away, right? Maybe you are online at midnight and you want to reply to your email then, in which case just say that, right? But put it in your syllabus, repeat it on your assignment sheets, make sure it's on your LMS. Make sure that your students know when they can expect to get feedback. Is it going to be within 28 hour, 24 hours, 48 hours, right? Is it going to be a week? Um, and exactly what sort of time of day is best to catch you. Take a whole day off from email. Just don't look at it. I have friends who have taken the little app off their phone so that they can't get push notifications. Um, I have not done that. I'm not that good. Um, but uh, a day away from email, at least, is remarkable in reducing our cognitive load so that we can then go back to work whenever, wherever and however we're working with more capacity to help our students. Put your lunch on your calendar and make it non-negotiable. Your job does not own every moment of the day. Eating is a very basic thing that you should be able to do without explaining it to someone else. I got type 2 diabetes two years ago, and suddenly I realized, OK, the days of me eating Snickers bars, little mini Snickers bars, between classes are over, right? But it shouldn't have taken a diabetes diagnosis for me to go, I am owed some rest. I am owed fuel for my body, right? So put lunch or dinner, depending on what time of day you teach and have your other responsibilities, Put it on your calendar. Make it as non-negotiable as being in the classroom. <coughs> Commuting is work. Count it as such. So um, when you are in your car, when you're walking to work, you're on the bus, however you arrive on campus, that is part of the energy you have to devote to your job each day. Don't sort of say to yourself, OK, I've got six solid hours of work. If your commute is an hour on either side of that, that's not true, right? So please think about uh, that commute as part of your energy reserves and energy depletion. Build flex days into your syllabus, so at least two per semester. They can go anywhere on the syllabus, and you can use them anywhere on the syllabus, and they can do multiple things. So let's say that you went over a specific equation in class, and they didn't quite get it in that class period, and you need more time. You have a flex day that you can pull in and say, you know what, we're going to do that again, because I really feel like it's going to be helpful. It could be that you have a class where they're doing a lot of writing, and you say, you know what, Instead of reading that day, pull in a flex day, we're all going to write together. We're going to have a workshop where we all co-work for that class period. It could be 
that you are sick. It could be that everyone in your class is burned out and needs a mental health day. There are so many applications of the flex day. But if you have a syllabus that is end-to-end -end scheduled, there will be something that goes wrong and you can't respond to it easily. It increases your stress and that of your students. And then create community. Community is one of the things that research shows has a really tempering effect on all the stresses of our lives. That community does not have to be your department, your program. It doesn't have to be on campus. Your most meaningful communities could be all kinds of places. If you're someone who does a lot of teaching online, your community may be online. My teaching community is not really at Knox. My teaching community, well, it used to be on Twitter. Now we're sort of like dispersed around the internet. But um, that's where I've gotten some of the best ideas that I use and where I talk to other people about things that are not working in my classroom. So if you lack community, think about what kind of community it is that you want and where you might find it. If you're someone who feels you have the capacity to build community, think about where there is a lack and how you can fill it. <coughs> so what is one way that you can build some kindness to yourself into the fall semester? Take a couple of minutes, and I will keep time for you. Thank you. So in conclusion, I want to share this part of the poem, Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know kindness is the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes everywhere with you like a shadow or a friend. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. So we have some stick mics, yes. and if you have questions, this is the period for Q&A. So please raise your hand, and we'll get a stick mic to you so that we can all hear what you have to say, and I will take my best shot at answering your question. Uh, well, thank you for, for this uh, great lecture and, and talk. Uh, a lot of times the, the problem becomes that we have these good ideas like you have presented here, but the problem is how to have others on board <coughs> and basically replicate this and <coughs> infuse it into the <coughs> culture of 
culture of the department or the university. Yeah. So ha have you done anything about that or have any experience with that? Yeah, so um, how do you get this, how do you spread the word, right? So first of all, I'm not an evangelist, much as I'm standing up here evangelizing, right? I'm, I don't believe in, um, that it is incumbent upon us to preach the good word, right, um, to other people. I think the way that it is demonstrated most effectively is by doing it, right? It is by inviting people into our classrooms when we think something is working really well and having that open community and for people to be able to see the difference. It's sharing our assignments with one another. It is um, offering models of our syllabi to new faculty members who are joining us, right? It's having casual conversations, not conversations that are like, let me tell you about this thing you must do, <laughs> that instead are just about like, I'm thinking of trying this new thing this fall, because this is what I've been thinking about, and just seeing where those conversations go. Um, I have had, I've been talking about this for probably three years now. And so there is a vast network of educators who have come to things like this and who have started little bit by little bit doing some of the things that I suggested and that they have come up with and generated themselves. And so there is a, a wider sense in the educational community of this, this is something that people want to engage in. I think that that can be tapped into too, right? There are online communities that help. There are um, little reading groups that people can have. You have a whole structured thing that's gonna be happening here all year that you can participate in, right? And build cohorts of community. Um, so I think there's lots and lots of ways of doing it. I would say none of them are top-down ordering people to do it, right? They are leading by example. Other questions? Hi, thank you for being here today. I think it's a good way to start a semester. Um, so my question is, I teach a lot of large lecture classes, and you know, a lot of these ideas are, are great, but how, do you have any specific kind of ideas for how to scale some of these to when you're teaching 80, 100, 200 students yeah. and, and also being kind to yourself in the process. Yeah, yeah. I think um, the first thing is that if we're hooked into that old way of thinking of our students as antagonists, then having 200 students who we think have it out to get us is a horribly unkind way to live, right? So. Um, that mental shift is really important. But in terms of scaling things, um, the little reading check-ins that I showed you are scalable in that you are not responding. They're not extra grading, right? You're not writing anything on them. You are skimming through them and taking away some stuff that actually then helps you build classes that are super responsive to student needs, right? You're really dialed in to what they found confusing, interesting, compelling. Um, things like designing the syllabus differently, you can do no matter what size your class is. And you can also have your students um, annotate syllabi, right? So rather than just giving them a syllabus on the first day and going through it, which I always found deathly for myself, regardless of what my students thought of it, um, I give them a syllabus now and they go home and annotate it for their first piece of homework and then they come back and if it's a big class then they get into little groups or into partners and they talk about what they wrote on their syllabus and I, I tell them what annotation is, it's just taking notes, right? And they give them some guidelines for how to respond to things and then maybe those groups can work up to, you know, telling the whole class some of the things that were really important, or easily setting up a form where people can give you that kind of feedback. Um, was there anything in particular where you were like, I like that idea, but I have no idea how to do it with 200 people? No, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I'm very good at coming up with things on the fly um, for things. So if somebody is sitting there going like, I do have a thing I want to know how you do for 200 people, come talk to me afterwards for sure or right just, now. Just as an example, the kind of metacognitive check-ins about or the check-ins about how much reading you did, right? If you've got a class of 150 students, how might you utilize that reading check-in um, to kind of plan your lecture for the next day? So one of the great things about the reading check-ins, mine are through Google Forms, but Microsoft has you know, comparable stuff, um, is that the data can be downloaded individually, so you read every individual form, or it comes in pie charts and graphs, right? So you can see super fast how many students did the reading. Was it 50%, was it 25%, right? And make some adjustments. It's really fast to be able to see, if you give them a multiple choice option, right, then you super fast can read, oh, okay, the students were confused by X and not Y, or more than Y, right? So um, just manipulating the way that you receive the data saves you a whole lot of time, but still makes it actionable. There's a question, there's one there and there's one here. Here's a mic. So when I tell students that they can use whatever font size they want, they say, no, but really, what font? Right. <laughs> and so um, maybe can you give us some recommendations of how you front load at the beginning of the semester to really clearly communicate early on? I trust that you'll choose a font that makes sense for you, <laughs> <laughs> or margins, or you know, yeah. how many citations they're going to use, or something like that. You've got it exactly right, which is you do have to front load this, right? It's, and because our students come through an educational system that's antagonistic too. So they are primed to expect that sort of relationship. So I do a number of different exercises. So the first is that they <coughs> annotate the syllabus, right? And then they come back and they tell me like, this was confusing, or I really liked this policy, or why did you do this? And they get to see that I'm actually interested in their opinions, that I don't take it personally when they say like, this didn't work for me, that I will actually say like, okay, let's edit it together. What would be better language to explain what I mean, right? So it's lots of little things that demonstrate that trust building. Um, I have a conversation with them about grading, for example. We read a couple of things, uh, different perspectives on if grading is useful or not, what kind of grading is useful, and then we have a conversation about it. Or if you've got a huge class where you can't have a, an, easily, an easy conversation, then you go back to the forums, right? And you ask people to give you some feedback that way so you can digest it in a time and place that is more useful to you. Um, but it's a lot of foregrounding stuff at the beginning of class, knowing that it's going to have real rewards towards the end of class and make your life so much easier by the time you get towards the end of the semester when everyone's tired and you don't want to answer the question of like, no, we're really which fun, like 17 more times, right? This lady here had her hand up. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. So you did sort of answer it, but I've been um, working over the last few years implementing collaborative grading into my classes, and that's one of the things that I deal with a lot is students, by the time they get to college, have been indoctrinated into a system that very much yeah. uses traditional grading, and they have a lot of anxiety and fear at the beginning of the semester when, when you say, this is how collaborative grading is going to work right. because they're used to, but just tell me what my grade is. Yeah. And they have anxiety about um, meeting GPA requirements yep. and fulfilling scholarship requirements and things like that. So how I do some conversations and reading as well, but how do you help students manage that anxiety that they have when they've grown up in a system that works one way and now we're introducing something different and they may have some fear around yes, that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I had them read The Case Against Grades by Alfie Cohn. And we have a really frank conversation about like, let's talk about what high school was like. Let's talk about how grades were awarded. Let's talk about what that physically felt like when you had to turn in a paper or did an exam. Let's talk about what it mentally felt like to prepare for those things. 
And we talk about how much anxiety and fear were in that system, right? So that then I can flag, like, this system is not more anxiety producing, right? This is not more frightening. This is actually trying to respond to the things that you're telling me with your experience. And it is always their experience, right? All the classes, all the times I have this conversation, there always is this real pent up feeling of like, it was so hard. I was anxious all the time. I was throwing up. I'm on medication. I'm like all of these things, right? And then to segue into, so let's think about a better way of doing this. I also ask my students permission to do a different kind of grading. So at the end of that kind of that conversation, I say, okay, I would like to do it this way. What are your thoughts? We have a conversation, and then I also um, have an anonymous Google form where people can leave feedback for the next 24 hours. So that if there's someone who didn't want to say anything in class but is like, no, I really love getting A's, right? They can tell me that. And, I can, and so this takes more than a class period, right? It takes two or three class periods to go through this whole thing. But it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Um, and again, that the syllabus stuff, the way that I run those first few classes establishes this is going to be different, right? Do you, just as a follow-up, do you, if a student says, no, I don't want to do it this way, this is uncomfortable, I just want you to grade my paper and give me the feedback that I'm used to, do you accommodate that or how would you work with a student who says, no, I'm very uncomfortable with this or I don't give you permission? When they report that that is what they want, there's always a requirement, whether it's in the class or whether it's on that form, to tell me why. What is animating that? Because then I can actually talk with them about, okay, is this going to respond to that why or not, right? And I've never had a student who, when we talked about the why, stuck with the old way. Like, it was familiar, and I was like, of course it is. You've had an entire educational system that is like this, right? So we have talked about it, and then their choice has been to go with the new way. But I would accommodate a student who said, absolutely not. But I would also make them do some form of self-assessment alongside it, so they wouldn't just get me saying, like, you got this grade, right? They would have to participate in some way. Thank you. Other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm here to answer your questions if you want to have them in person too, OK? Thank you all for coming. Um, let me just also say this afternoon at 1.30, Upstairs in the Chickamauga room, we're having a syllabus workshop that Kate is, is leading, so I welcome you to attend that as well. Bring a copy of a syllabus that you'd like to think about doing one thing to, to make it uh, uh, kinder for yourself and for your students. Also, there is a sign-up sheet just outside this door on a table. If you missed it coming in, please add your name there so that we can send you a link for a feedback form. Absolutely. No. Any font, write big letters, all caps, whatever you want to do. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.